Well, hello out there, Internet family, and welcome back to another episode of the Rice Cast. We are back. We are back in business. We took a couple weeks off there. Uh, heard from a lot of you. Heard from our devoted fans who are who are who who they love the show so much, Pastor, that they just they want to let me know that they love it. And the way that they do that is by yelling at me when we don't put out new episodes. I, I thought camping in front of your house was a little extreme. It was. Much, <laughs> a little it much, too much. Bull horns at night, you know. Yeah, uh, we were working on it. We're here. We're back. <laughs> you can pack up your tents and go home. It's all my fault. My schedule has been uh, very busy the last three weeks, and uh, uh, a, a number of various things from out of town meetings, staff meetings, and and uh, so forth. And uh, so, uh, and it was a way of meetings last week. So anyway, this, it's been a very busy time. Then did take a few days off. Uh, toward the end of the week, just to to uh, have a little recreation, uh, but it's been a busy three weeks, yeah. And uh, so it's good to be back, though, and uh, looking forward to being back at Calvary this Sunday, uh, continuing our Gospel Vision series, which is has gone uh, it seems like very well. Yeah. People responded yeah, yeah. well, and I know uh, Brent's message Sunday just continued that. He and it was a great message. Sure. Um, so uh, we're very happy to have him on the team. We've heard many many good things. So anyway. It's good to be back, and uh, good to be back on the uh, podcast today. We're back. We're doing it. Well, I mean, one big thing that happened, uh, we had a grandbaby, right? Right. Our Between son, our Stephen, uh, and his wife, Mary Stewart, uh, welcomed their first child a week ago Sunday night. I was actually in Pittsburgh when I got the news, and um, and I haven't uh, actually held my newest grandchild yet. I'm hoping to do that in a few days. My wife is, has been up there this week. And I'm hoping to get up there as quick as I can, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, but he's doing great. Mom and Dad are doing great, and uh, we're very very thankful for the birth of Amos Benjamin Rice, Amos uh, Benjamin, our fifth grandchild, and uh, the first uh, child of our son, famous Amos, I, famous Amos. That's a good. You know, we always get little nicknames for him, so maybe That's that'll it, be yeah. it. Famous Amos. Yeah, you always wonder where you you name the kid, but you wonder what's the name actually. Absolutely, going to end yeah, up being. Yeah. Uh, what number of grandbaby is this five. for you? Five. 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 Yep. Filled yep. out the hand. That's one. Filled out the just... hand, and we have one coming with our middle daughter. She's pregnant and due early next year, so, uh, uh, we're trying to be fruitful and multiply. That's, <laughs> that's great. Well, congratulations. Thank you. We're very happy. Congratulations very to, to Stephen. Stephen was here. A lot of people will probably remember Stephen. He was well, Stephen, of course, uh, worked on, on our team. team here for a while before we sent him off to be a part of a church plant. And uh, they're in Gainesville now as That's part right. of the Salt Church in Gainesville, doing a terrific job up there. And um, we're very proud of him. I know many of you, you come here for the sage wisdom and counsel. And then there are others that come for the sports updates. So we got to do it. The Gators... One tough loss already. Well, we've had two. We tough have two. Losses. <laughs> two. Oh no, I missed bitter. one. You did. You're not. I know you're not up on your college as much. I'm but, not uh, up on the college. Yeah, time. we're we're uh, all the Florida teams have. We're we're a long way from the glorious era <laughs> of years ago, but uh, Florida still has a chance for a good season. But we had a bitter loss to the Kentucky Wildcats. That's tough. That was a tough one to swallow. My, I have many Kentucky friends, and they were happy to remind me of it. Right. Uh, and uh, we lost at Kentucky for the first time since 1986. Oh, no. It was a bitter defeat. Oh, that's a tough one. Who was the other loss to? Alabama. Oh, Alabama. That yeah. was a great game. Uh, it was a great game uh, and, uh, was, you know, played well enough maybe to, to have pulled something special off, but they didn't come. They didn't get it done. Oh, that's tough, Pastor. But we are consoled in the warm and welcoming arms of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. <laughs> rolling along at They're Florida. rolling along, and uh, that's good news. Tom Brady uh, doing his thing. And uh, so uh, the Rays are out, uh, unfortunately. The we, Rays are out. We're out. Had a great season, though. But uh, they're out. And uh, I guess the, the hockey team, Lightning, are off and running. Just started. Yeah. Raised up the banner. Lost the game 6-2. to two. <laughs> 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 Range of emotions. There you go. On that night in Amelie Arena. Uh, but yes, sports are off and running. And it's the fall, Pastor. You yep. got to love the f- It's It's October. It is. Cheryl and I actually, I was in meetings uh, with our North American Mission Board last week in Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. which is great to see our church planning. And Calvary's had, you mm-hmm. know, some folks here at Calvary. Remember, we kind of even before X150, we were trying to lean into church planning in, in Pittsburgh. And all of our initial plans didn't work out quite the way we drew them up. But 
Uh, we are now seeing church planning happening in Pittsburgh, uh, Vintage Church, a church that we yeah. were happy to support, is doing great. And then another church that we're, we're hoping to support there. So we're seeing a second-generation church. And uh, so uh, there is fruit from our work in Pittsburgh that's going on. It was great to be up there for that. And then we took a few days, end of last week, uh, to just get a little break here in the fall. Went up to Vermont and New Hampshire, Cheryl and I. Mm. And so we got to see fall leaves and cool air, which yeah. ev- makes everyone jealous down here. It does. We You showed a, you ruthlessly showed us all a picture, uh, one of our meetings yesterday, of the— the trail the, you the guys had foliage walked. Foliage, and it was it was wonderful. I, and I'm glad you did, because sometimes I don't think fall is real. I think it's just something the Northerners make there up. There is something out there known as <laughs> fall. Jealous. And in certain places of the world, it's alive and well. <laughs> Things change colors. Well, that's great. We're, we're very happy to be back. Uh, we're happy about this series. I want to say this a little bit, uh, just because you mentioned Brent, and he did a great job this last Sunday. We'll put the link to the message like we always do in the podcast description. And as we're rolling into November and our missions month, we got a lot of fun stuff we're talking about in our missions month coming up. Uh, you know, there was that season we just coming out of COVID, the pandemic, where, where missions, especially international missions, has been really tricky and difficult. Yeah. Obviously, meeting for everyone was was tough, right? So how are... How are you able to plant churches? How are you to start gathering these churches? And it's just been fun the last couple months, and now rolling into November, getting to talk about all the exciting things that are happening. Um, so yeah, you, we've got, you know, this year we'll see teams going out again, which we hadn't seen right. that for, for quite a while. In fact, I think commissioning a team this Sunday. This Sunday. Um, and a number of teams headed out now over the next couple months. So we've kind of, it's not that X-150 stopped. It didn't. Right. Uh, but we had to pause some things. Church plants found it difficult to launch. There were churches that wanted to launch, but mm-hmm. hasn't really been the right time. And uh, now they're launching again. We, we celebrated the launch of one in South Florida. And um, we're, again, talking about another launch in Pittsburgh. So uh, those things are gearing up. And I think as we end this year and go into next year, uh, again, we, none of us know what the future. We've learned to be flexible. So we don't know what the future holds. But I, it really looks like, boy, we're going to see a lot of energy back now mm-hmm. in our sending and uh, supporting of other churches and missions happening around the world. That's very, very good. And maybe connecting a couple dots here early, forgive me if this is way off base, when you when you go to a place like Pittsburgh, when you see a church that we've helped plant, uh, how what does that fill you with? What does that make you feel? Oh, you know, that's exciting. I, I often say I wish uh, in our network everybody could go to our uh, North American Mission Board trustee. I'm a trustee mm-hmm. of the North American Mission Board which is the arm in our network that does North American missions. And uh, I wish you could go. We, we do our meetings about twice a year in, in cities that we're trying to plant churches. Mm. And uh, to just go into those areas and then meet with these church planters, usually they're younger, uh, and to hear the stories of these churches that are meeting across these cities, you just see the future of our movement. You see it happening. Mm. And um, uh, it, it's so encouraging. It's so exciting. Uh, to see these churches. Uh, Pittsburgh was a very hard place for us to gain ground in church planting for some reason. Mm. There are churches in Pittsburgh, but in our network, there were just very few. Just It was a hard area. Sure. Now we're seeing some, some strong churches planted and starting to make progress, and uh, that's very exciting. Yeah, the dot I was going to connect is maybe being a grandfather, and you're yeah. seeing the future of you this do. thing, and and it feeling well, like yeah, I hadn't it's connected that on. dot. You you beat me to it, but yeah, you're right. That's that's exactly what you see. You see the future. You see it multiplying. Sometimes it takes a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it's hard getting it going. Uh, multiplication is slower than addition. Remember mm-hmm. that. Multiplication is slower than addition, but. Once it begins to move, mm-hmm. then it is exponentially greater. And so what we're seeing is is investment at Calvary in multiplication, and uh, that's really where we feel like God was leading us to put our resources and our time and energy. Mm-hmm. Addition can be more fun, and uh, you see the sure. results quicker, yeah. but multiplication has a kingdom impact. And so that's why our X-150 vision is kind of our, our guiding initiative here, mm-hmm. to be about planning churches, raising champions, and rescuing children. Mm-hmm. And we're excited to talk about that a ton, starting here Sunday, October 31st. Yeah, a couple weeks. We've got a few more weeks in our Gospel Vision series, but mm-hmm. in November we really try to shine a light on our, our, our strategic initiative and missions, and we're going to be 
uh, sharing some good things, have some good teaching, but also just hearing great stories about what God's doing here and around the world. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun month. Uh, but let's jump into the, what we want to talk about today. We talked about uh, lots of things coming out in the news, lots of, uh, lots of topics, even just before we started recording as we're talking through. Um, but one kind of theme that seems to be coming out a couple of different ways, there's something going on um, within the Southern Baptist Convention that people may have heard of. We talked, you know, acknowledging that different people are connected in different ways to these yep. stories. Um, but this is one that had been kind of simmering, seemed to be, there's a lot going on with it right now. Maybe if you could just from a 10,000 yeah, foot view, tell, uh, tell everybody what's going on. You have to stay at 10,000 foot or you get really in the weeds. Um, but people may see this, uh, on social media, it's been very prominent for those who kind of follow that thing. And, and I think there have been some inklings of this nationally. Um, at the convention last summer, there was a motion brought forth on the floor of the convention that ask the executive committee, and this is a committee that meets when the Southern Baptist Convention is not meeting. It kind of is the Southern Baptist Convention administrative apparatus when the convention is not meeting. Mm-hmm. And um, the executive committee was um, asked, well, really ordered, a convention passed a motion saying that there would be an, an, an internal investigation, an inve- actually an external investigation, into the handling of sexual abuse allegations, uh, which has uh, sadly uh, marked our network as it has almost anything. You know, mm. we, we've seen it in the culture. And there have been some really uh, uh, sad cases, uh, tragic cases, and there have been some real question about how those cases were handled. Yeah. Um, we've talked about some of that. I've written about some of that. And, uh, and then in September, uh, the executive committee met with their trustees and initially declined to, uh, it all revolved around a very legal, um, point of waiving attorney client privilege, Okay, which people know if you do that, that's, that puts you in a great deal of vulnerability, but the sure. convention had asked for an investigation whereby, uh, attorney client privilege would be waived by the executive committee. And at first they declined to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they, they actually then had a second meeting and then a third meeting in which uh, gradually m- there was a great deal of pressure until finally a majority of the trustees agreed to waive attorney client privilege um, on behalf of the executive committee so that there would be a review of how some of these allegations uh, regarding sexual abuse were handled. Mm-hmm. So that's the 10,000 foot view of it. And so just to, to clarify a point you mentioned there when you said an external review would be a third party coming yeah, a in. Yeah, third to party had been it? hired uh, and um, a task force appointed by the convention um, was going to contract a third party to do an external investigation, which basically means combing through emails and documents and communications to see how um, these situations were handled. Mm -hmm. Were they handled appropriately or inappropriately? And, of course, there's an accusation that some of them were not handled appropriately. Right. Uh, It's almost certain that there were a few that that weren't handled appropriately. Um, Again, that gets complex, but um, that's the allegation. And uh, so now there is going to be an an investigation of sorts into how those things were handled. And, uh, you know, there could be some potentially embarrassing uh, mm-hmm. information released. I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But um, it, uh, it it certainly is something that weighs heavy upon us right now. Yeah. Now, does some of this go back to that several years ago, that Houston yes. article? Oh, Houston it's all Chronicle, connected where, you know, when you had the, the what was sometimes known in the secular culture as the Me Too movement. Mm-hmm. And... Um, where all of a sudden there was this huge um, light that was shining on sexual abuse and sexual harassment issues. Uh, It began to hit every area of life. All of a sudden, companies were under greater scrutiny. Companies, uh, schools. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I, it's not a Baptist problem. It's a human being problem, mm-hmm. but it's going to hit every group, including religious groups. And before that, of course, we, we read the many things about the Catholic Church and how mm-hmm. sexual abuse issues were being handled or not being handled well That's enough. Right. 
Uh, well, the the uh, Houston Chronicle did a series of articles dating back to I forget now, 2019 uh, maybe. The date from you, that sounds about right. It's a couple of years. Uh, 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 you know, investigating quite a number of these cases where in Baptist churches uh, allegations had been leveled against either volunteer leaders or staff leaders or in some cases pastors, and uh, that were not handled like they should have been handled. Mm-hmm. Uh, some dating back decades and um and uh, so it was a quite a, a scandalous series and it, it was humbling uh, to those of us who uh, are a part of our baptist network mm-hmm. and it just showed again we we have problems like everyone else has problems and that's not minimizing it it's just the it's a human problem yeah and we didn't always handle them as well as we needed to mm-hmm. uh, and so you know the the catholic scandals were well known they were well published they were front page news right and uh, our structure is much different than a Catholic structure because our structure is independent, autonomous churches voluntarily cooperating, mm-hmm. whereas the Catholic structure is a more hierarchical structure. And so right. it became a question of bishops moving people exactly. underneath yeah, yeah. them. Well, that doesn't happen in Baptist life that way. But some of the same tendencies to uh, cover up, to not report, to not deal with things in the way they should have been dealt with ha- happened it just it manifested itself differently. Mm-hmm. It might be a pastor moving from one town to another. It might be one church not communicating with another, or it might be a church trying to handle these issues without calling in law enforcement. All of the above mm. were part of it. And uh, there are some real tragic cases. And it's a cautionary tale for every one of us mm-hmm. about how these things must be handled. We've talked about some of these things before on podcasts, but how these things must be handled, what is the right way to handle them, what is the wrong way to handle them. Yeah. And institutions kind of reflexively want to cover right. what we do right. and hope things never will come out. We And this is a human being issue. It goes back right. to Adam and Eve. We want to cover our sin and uh, instead of dealing with the sin and uh, hoping that, well, we'll cover it. We'll yeah. hide it. That's the human tendency. Go back, Adam and Eve and Garden. Let's hide yeah. and hope that uh, if we hide it, mm-hmm. it's taken care of. And what we're seeing is that didn't work. Right. And if we had read Genesis, we would have known it doesn't work. Right. Hiding doesn't work. Uh, it it, uh, it doesn't go away. Right. Because we bury it in the ground. And uh, so this is just one example of that yeah and it's and there are several i mean there's several that have come out recently um another story making some headlines right now is uh brian houston from hillsong who's now being accused of a sort of cover-up some some information he may or may not have known in the late 90s about his father Um, another one that comes to mind sort of recently was um uh, I'm I'm coming short of his name right now. The apologist who passed recently, Zacharias, Ravi Zacharias, yep, right? Yep, we yep. we find come to find out yep. that there were allegations levied that they sort of didn't take seriously, kind of dismissed, right? Um, and, and he told them that that they were they yep. were baseless, but you know they probably I think if you ask them they would say they didn't look into it enough at that point. They would now, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm just, what is that in C? You said it's a human thing, and I think that's exactly right. We're talking institutionally right now, but we also know as humans, we, we try to minimize some things. Well, like institutions this. are just human nature reflected on a larger and kind of level. Mm-hmm. I, I, institutions are flawed because human beings are flawed. Right. But again, go back to the creation narrative. It's so telling. When Adam and Eve sinned, what was the first thing that happened? Well, they, they realized they were naked. Suddenly they saw their nakedness. Mm-hmm. There was shame where never before had been shame. Now, what did they do to cover the shame? Well, they sewed fig leaves. That's mm-hmm. more than a children's story. They hid. They tried to cover themselves. Mm. And we've been trying to cover ever since. Mm. So when God came looking for them, they were hiding. They were hiding. And we've been hiding ever since. Yeah, um, because we have all sinned, so there are we all deal with shame and we all deal with guilt, and the human, uh, you know, uh, tendency is well, let's cover it, let's mm-hmm. cover ours, let's find some fig leaves, <laughs> let's find a bush to hide behind, yeah, yeah, and uh, let's hope nobody finds it, right? And 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 so you know, Jesus came to say, hey, look, I know your sin. I see it, mm-hmm. I pay the price for it, so you can be reconciled, you can be free of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but dealing with sin 
is a human dilemma. How do we deal with those things? And, uh, you know, the, the, in a secular culture, it's very hard to know. They really don't have a framework for dealing with sin. And in the Christian culture, we certainly have one, but we we tend to default back to let's hide right, and um, let's, uh, you know, let's cover up or let's judge others in, you know, other ways. So um, it, it, it's, it's a real challenge, and we're seeing that on a number of levels. I mean, I, you're aware of the uh, former uh, Tampa Bay football coach. Uh, oh, this yeah. week it's in the news, yeah. um, John Gruden, uh, and it's I'm still trying to process this story, but all these uh, emails came out mm-hmm. from over a decade ago, uh, some of which had uh, unkind language and language that is uh, inappropriate in mm-hmm. today's context and probably should be in any context. Yep. I haven't read the email, so I'm, I'm not speaking um, uh, with knowledge about them. I'm reading reports about them, which always makes me a little bit suspicious because I, I want to know, you mm-hmm. know, are those perspectives valid? But assuming that they are, then there were things in those emails that were unkind and inappropriate speech, um, and um, and now he's paying a price for it. Mm. He's paying a price for it. So, but again, the tendency is, hey, I—, I I want to cover. I don't want to deal with things, and and now we're seeing inevitably these things tend to come up. Mm-hmm. Is the and I think like when you think of secular institutions, it uh, I don't want to say it makes a, a little bit more sense. That sounds super insensitive, but in Christianity, in our in our tribe, there's such a precedence for confession, repentance. It's almost mm-hmm. like the Bible is just littered from the beginning that this will be the process. You will fall short. You will have to do this. This is why this is in the Old Testament. There's a whole system for yep. sacrifices. There's a whole way of doing this. And then obviously all that changed with Jesus. But uh, it, so I guess that's that's sort of the question that comes up is is when religious institutions or religious individuals, uh, Christian uh, institutions, Christian individuals still are hesitant to acknowledge that something's wrong mm. or, or, or to, to say that we missed it here or yep. to say maybe this person isn't doing things exactly right. Do you have any thoughts on why? Well, it, because it's just, we're dealing with our human depravity. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're dealing with this, the, this, the current in the stream. Just like when we sin, our immediate human instinct is to cover that, mm-hmm. to hide that. Um, and if we can hide that, then we can avoid some of the consequences of it. We all deal with that. I think every person I'm talking to goes, yep, I've done that. Yep, yeah, yeah. I'm doing it right now. Yep, I'm. Uh, there are things. And there are things we, you know, uh, uh, that we certainly don't want public. We've all done things that would make us ashamed that we don't want everyone knowing. Yeah. So there's an appropriate and right way to confess. But we uh, we tend to avoid that. We don't want to confess our sin. And, um, and so now when you project that upon... Uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. You just see it there. There's this, let's not deal with it. And I think, um, again, there's so many levels to this. There's, there's, there's no one size, you know, fits all policy because again, not everything needs to be confessed to everybody at all. No one is suggesting that. Um, but let's talk about the institutions for a moment. Uh, and again, an issue, which we've talked about before the issue of sexual abuse, Mm -hmm. what we're learning, what we should have known all along, is that uh, when there is sin uh, of that nature, um, it must be brought into the light. You, you cannot sweep it under the rug in the name of, uh, under the guise of spirituality. Mm. The, the great mistake many churches have made is this is a sin problem um, therefore, we're going to deal with it within our context because we're used to dealing with sin problems. That's right. why we're here. So our churches tended to look at these things. We heard about somebody doing something to someone, and we thought, well, that's a sin problem. So, you know, let's deal with it internally. We don't call the police to deal with sin problems. Mm. Um, well, that's true to a point, mm-hmm. but you do call the police to deal with some sin problems. Yeah. If you know who has burn someone's house to the ground, you should call the police mm-hmm. because that is a sin problem, but it is more than a sin problem. That is also a criminal problem mm. uh, that violates the laws of our land. It's a crime. Right. And um, so if someone comes to me and says, hey, I'm struggling with lust, uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, and pornography, let's say. Well, that's not a criminal problem. Not necessarily. It could be, of course, in extreme cases. But in many cases, that's not a criminal problem. That's right. a sin problem. Let's right. deal with that as brothers in Christ or as as we do sin. Here's how we confess. Here's how we repent. Here are the guardrails we need. Here's how we need to change our behavior. And at that point, it's it's great that they're reaching out. Absolutely. At that and moment we in the story. want people to reach out. Right. You need people you can confess to. Uh, honestly, that's the best thing you could do right. is to come and say, is to have enough, ideally, and this is idealism, but we would be in healthy enough relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ that we could sit down with our brothers and sisters, and not everyone, this is not a Sunday morning announcement, hey, let me tell you what, <laughs> right. okay. this is, hey, I've got a, bro, you know, brothers in Christ meeting in a discipleship group or a prayer group or, a, you know, and I say, listen, guys, I, I need to confess my sin. Mm-hmm. I, I need to tell somebody I'm struggling with this, and I need prayer and counsel and and maybe some accountability, you know, because mm-hmm. I, I just need to drag it. There's something about dragging it from the darkness yeah. into the open yeah. that humbles us. It's painful. It's embarrassing, but it's healing. Yeah. And so we, that, that's, a, that's a spiritual issue. What we need to, however, be able to see is that some issues, are, they're still sin issues, but now they're criminal issues. And right. this is where sexual abuse comes in, I think, uh, it, so we, we've said this before, anytime we talk about it, bear saying again, when someone violates another person sexually, that's a crime. Mm-hmm. And whatever else you're going to do about that crime, you must call the police. Mm-hmm. You must report that. Um, and that's uncomfortable. That can be difficult if it's in your family or it's someone you know. But um, there is a responsibility that we have to report. And the reason we have gotten to this place is because human beings covered it up. It was mm-hmm. a family issue. We just And, and people have suffered, um, many, many people have suffered because they were abused as children, again, women and children primarily, and uh, they bear the scars of that pain. Yeah. So for anybody listening, it is not okay. It is not normal. It is not just something uncle so-and-so does and mm-hmm. we kind of, you know, stay away from him. It is a criminal act. And uh, what if anything you've learned over the last few years of scandals from Penn State a few years ago yeah. to religious scandals to even what you're reading about now is, look, if you know something and don't report, then there's liability for you. Yeah, You've got to do your job. And your job is not to investigate. Your job is not to prosecute. Your job is not to determine legality. It's to simply say somebody, because somebody's being hurt, Mm. somebody's being harmed, and this is a big deal. And therefore, uh, institutions, and so we have tried to, and not tried, we have trained our volunteers at Calvary. Mm -hmm. Um, We have an ongoing training mechanism in place where if you volunteer here, if you are on staff here, you learn, you don't simply report something up the chain. You don't report it to your supervisor First thing you do is you report it to the appropriate authorities. Mm-hmm. Then you tell your, listen, here's what I saw. Here's yeah. what I know. Now, I, I I get that that's messy. I get that that's uncomfortable. I get people like, I don't know, I suspect. And there are all kinds of questions that come up there. But we cannot simply um, handle these matters as an internal problem. Uh, they're a sin problem. Make no mistake about it. Yeah, yeah. But they're also a criminal problem. Right. And therefore, you know, that's that's the conundrum. The challenging thing, I think, that that uh, as an older man now, I, I don't know, am I older or whatever? I'm uh, 58. What, Spring whatever that chicken. Makes. Thank you. Thank you very much. But having lived now a few decades and, and being able to remember well, you know, back a couple of decades, mm-hmm. um, this was never talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, I never got any training on this. Mm. Uh, you know, in, in school, seminary, you know, I have a bachelor's degrees, two graduate degrees. I don't think I ever got any training about this. I don't think I ever learned anything about that. I don't think there was ever a course I went to or a book I read. And um, I, I, I so I, I do sometimes have some sympathy when I I hear about maybe churches or issue people who maybe in the, you know, going back to the 80s and 90s did not follow the protocols that we would follow today. 
they should have. Mm. We should have known. Mm-hmm. I'm not excusing mm-hmm. it. We should have known. Right. And the appropriate way, by the way, if there's a mistake, if because I've heard of some pastors who made mistakes back in the 90s. Maybe they didn't report right away. They yeah. didn't know what, you know, okay. I can accept that you weren't trained. Maybe we didn't know. But the appropriate mechanism at this point is to acknowledge that and go, right. you know what? I made the mistake. We right. should have. We should have been told. And I am so sorry. And now I do know. You can't, you, you don't excuse it. Don't ignore it. Don't refuse to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there are some older pastors who are making a mistake today when, when they're asked about things that happened in the 80s and 90s, and they just kind of shrug it off. Mm. Well, that's what we did then, or we didn't know, or we, we weren't trained. Well, it doesn't make it okay. Right. Acknowledge it. Confess it. Yeah. And I, I think most people will give a measure of grace and forgiveness if you own the issue. Mm-hmm. It's when people don't own the issue yeah, exactly. that you can't fix it. So we, we've got to own the issue. I dealt with this. I don't know if I've ever discussed this before um, uh, on the podcast, but I dealt with this. With, if it wasn't the first year of my pastor, it was within the first two years, I mm. would say. Um, and I, I, I don't know the exact timeline. I became a pastor when I was 20, which is way too soon. I was still a junior in college when a church in Alabama called me to be their pastor. Hmm. Someday we need to just do a whole podcast. Yeah, on there's more Bethel there. Bethel Baptist in Door, Alabama, which is a great church, still going today. Love those people. Still keep in touch with some of them. Uh, great memories. Hmm. So I'm 20 years old and I become a pastor. I wasn't even married. I was engaged to be married. I was married like a, a couple months later, hmm. like a year later. Somewhere in there, I, I had already been married, so it was probably in the second year of my ministry okay. there, but I hadn't been married long. Um, a, a young girl came to me. Um, she would have been about 15, with, brought by her aunt. They were both active in our church, the aunt and this do- girl, uh, to say she was being abused by her stepfather. Hmm. So I'm 21. I might have been 22. Okay. Never in my life. I didn't grow up in that kind of environment. It, was, it wasn't something I'd ever heard of. Honestly, I'm not sure I even knew it occurred. Mm. You know, you just 22. There's sins you still don't know about much. Uh, and and here's a 15 year old girl telling me she's being abused by her stepfather, um, who was not active in our church and and was kind of seen as a rough guy. So okay. he, he kind of would have fit the stereotype. Yeah. Um, I, I'd never been trained. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, but I did call the police mm. and say, what do I do? Yeah. I went to, I did that. I, uh, and they didn't have even the units that they have now. Right. And they kind of walked me through, well, you know, this is, they, they would have handled it different than to, today than they did then. But back then I remember talking to a police officer who said, well, here's the way it happens. If you report this. Yeah. And I, because I didn't report the name, I said, "There's a girl who's come to me, and I'm trying to figure out what to do." Yeah, he said, yeah. "Well, here's what happens," and he walked me through what happens. He said, "You need to." Ex-. They wouldn't do this today, so I hesitate to explain the protocol. But back then, he said, "Now you tell her, you explain to her, if she wants to file a report, this is what will happen." I had also the next day gone to professors because I was in school, and um, uh, I asked my professors what to do, and I called my pastor, Pastor Anderson, what to do. All of whom basically said talk to the authorities, ask them what to do. Mm. And long story short, we did. They arrested the man. He mm. went to trial, was convicted. I believe he was convicted. Uh, uh, I know he went to trial, and um, I believe he did prison time, which is rare, by the way, for sexual abuse crimes. Um, but I, I tell you that story to say I dealt with that in the first two years of my ministry. I had received no training, no right. coaching, I didn't even know such a thing existed. And I could have easily botched it. Yeah. I don't tell the story to go, see, I did it the right way. Right, right, right. Because I've often thought, what if the roles in that story were reversed? What if the girl coming and saying something had happened was somebody I barely knew or was Mm. considered a little flaky, a little flighty, you know, like her? And the guy she was accusing was an outstanding, was a deacon of our church. Right, right. And somebody I knew well. Would I have handled it as well? I don't know. I hope I would have. I, mm-hmm. I think today I understand I have a responsibility to pass that on to other people investigating it. So I thank God that I did, but, uh, it, you know, th- that we were able to do it right. right, um, right. It, it's, uh, these are challenging cases, and I can tell you that every pastor, every leader has had to deal with it at some level, at mm-hmm. some level. 
accusations are made or suspicions. And so we've tried to teach our staff. We have policies in place here. Um, you have to report a situation that's brought to you. That's the one takeaway there, yeah. I, I guess. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's, it's true. And it's a, it's an important perspective to have that there's, there's people dealing with situations they may or may not be prepared for. And, um, I think that's really important. And I think that there's a, there's so much that you've touched on, you've shared about in this podcast. Uh, but I think there's definitely this, um, institutional level and there's, there's a personal application and it's on both that if the instinct flares up to cover something up, to not right. talk about something, it should almost be an immediate red flag. Red flag. It, you look, it's instinctive to cover things. Yeah. And I'm not saying ever again, I've, I repeat it. Everything, all your stuff doesn't need to be put on the front page of the right. Tampa Times right, tomorrow. Right. None of us want that. I, we, don't want, we don't want that for you, for me, for anyone. Yeah, That's yeah. not healthy necessarily. And by the way, I don't think it's wise to put stuff like that on social media. Yeah. I know some people kind of do therapy by social media. I think that's a terrible way to mm. do therapy. It's a terrible way to get affirmation and advice. Um, so I would encourage you not to air all your stuff on social media, yeah. hoping that you know people are liking this or posting that. I, I really don't think that's very healthy. Um, you do need some a few grounded people to talk to. Your point, though, is is this. When the instinct is, I, I the, the solution is to cover, mm. um, it's a red flag. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not saying everything needs to be known, but there is a, there is a healing power mm-hmm. in getting stuff out. And we resist it because it's hard and it's painful. Uh, but, uh, so for our, you know, we're talking about two different things, you know, we're talking about our own stuff. Right. And then we're talking about criminal activity. Right. And in criminal activity, look, you just have to report. You just have to report 100%. it. And, and, uh, it's a hundred percent. It's a, it's a dark, it's a hard, strong, dark, deep, whatever you want to say. It's a line. Don't cross it. Yeah. Uh, criminal stuff must be reported. Yep. And, um, and I think the other things we're seeing there are things that, you know, uh, there's, here's another cautionary point that you're seeing in all these stories, which is, uh, what you think you can hide, you you, you know, be careful. Yep. I, and it's one of the things we have to train our students and young people on today who've grown up in social media is just the world. They're like fish in the ocean. They don't right. know another world. Um, what you post, you think, oh, this is a joke. We've had to deal with high school students in this. You know, they'll post a joke, you know, and it'll have a sexual innuendo or they think it's funny. Mm-hmm. And again, I really feel for them because... I, when we were in high school, everybody says stuff they shouldn't d- say and does stuff they shouldn't do mm-hmm. and probably have told jokes with innuendos that are inappropriate. Mm-hmm. It's part of immaturity. Oh, yeah. Things that you think back on that you're embarrassed. Huh? Can you think back on things you're embarrassed about? Yeah. I shouldn't have said that. That joke. I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have used that. I. Okay. The problem today is you post it, and I want to tell you, 15 years from now, somebody's going to read it. Yeah. So be careful what you... First of all, don't say inappropriate things. Oh, Okay? Yeah. That's the first line. Right. Let's guard... Jesus told us we would be held accountable for every out of word. The Bible warns us about the, the problem with saying too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so first of all, let's be responsible. Let's mm-hmm. not say things that would embarrass ourselves. And one way of doing that is before you hit send on the email or the post or the Instagram, what, you know, post... If you've got a check in your spirit, yeah, stop. Mm. And if it's a funny joke, it'll be funny a day from now. But you'll have had 24 hours to think, maybe that one crossed a line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, be careful what you say. Yeah. And be careful the words you use because it can come back to you. And and so so don't say unkind things. Don't say inappropriate things. The Bible warns us about coarse jesting mm. and vulgar words. And sometimes we just, you know, we, we have a joke. Oh, it's a little off color. Or I'm just going to, you know, make fun of, of somebody's appearance. And, you know, I didn't mean anything by it. You know, the Bible warns us about that. Mm-hmm. Be careful about words that are harmful and hurtful and um, and angry. Look, I get there's a toxic kind of cancel culture out there and i get that there's some stuff in that that's really whacked out yeah for sure but acknowledging that there's a whole part of that that's whacked out and maybe goes too far on some things 
let's not say hurtful things. Right. Let's not say things that don't honor God and love others. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. <laughs> and then, for goodness sake, don't put it <laughs> don't put it in writing and post it and send it around. Yeah. Uh, because it, 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 the Bible tells us God is watching all the time. Right. So when you write that email, does it honor God? Does it, you know, we, we had that, does it honor God? Does it, ed, does it tell the truth? Does it edify other people? Mm-hmm. If everyone were to read this post, if mm-hmm. everyone were to read this email, if everyone who knew me were to hear this joke, mm-hmm. would they all go, that's appropriate and honors right. God? It's right. a funny or would they go, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that. Yeah. Well, if it's in that latter category, hey, let's use restraint. Let's use discipline. And what we're seeing is some, some in this day and age, it'll sure boomerang around. Also. Right. Because you used to say that as like a, just a precautionary hypothetical. Yep. What if everybody read? Well, well I now, tell you, there's a handful of cases now where I can tell you every email somebody sent was read by somebody and generally when it's read by somebody it finds its way right. leaks out into and i've look somewhere I, the, a number of cases from the investigation at, at the southern baptist convention to the john gruden case to mm-hmm. these other things i have said many times I, i've gone back to think wow what if somebody read every email i've written that was an right. internal staff yeah, you think that now, i don't know of anyone that would be explosive or they don't but i go mm, there are probably some things i said i wouldn't want everybody reading and uh so now let's be careful. Mm-hmm. Let's be careful. Again, I don't know anything we're hiding, you know, anything. But you just in casual conversation, you mm-hmm. say things like, "Boy, that person gets on my nerves." And you know, I know another case where you know it, it, somebody was talking about somebody who really got on their nerves, and they were using colorful language to describe that person. Um, and in you know, and in some cases, it's all true, right? It's all true. They really, you know. But you write it down, you send it around. And it lives on. Mm-hmm. It lives on. And then you, you know, what sounded funny at the time, mm-hmm. 10 years from now in a different context, you read it and you go, you know, I wish I hadn't said that. Yeah. I wish I had you a little more restraint. And we've all done it. Yep. We've all done it in some ways. So th- these are cautionary tales, but really you go back to the Bible and the Bible itself warns us to be careful, careful, careful with mm-hmm. our words. Yeah. A lot. It talks a lot about that. You know, when you think of the litany of things that could be discussed, that issue is brought up a lot in different parts of the Bible. It's a huge theme in Proverbs. It's a huge theme in the book of James. James, yeah, that's right. Um, You know, it's one of the major themes in Proverbs is communication. When I wrote a little Mm -hmm. book a few years ago uh, uh, to my son, you know, things you should know before you go, one of the chapters was on your speech, Mm -hmm. communication, what you say, how you say it. Uh, Because when I went through the book of Proverbs and I looked for themes, that was one of them. Words. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Watch your words. Yeah, and um, uh, be careful what you say. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I want, and I just want to kind of land our conversation here because we've talked about it. We've talked about it a lot. I just want to thank you for being open and all that you've shared in this podcast. Uh, it's been really great. Uh, but I want to land on because we talked some about this. I just want to get back to it. The con, the Christian concept that is so core to our faith of uh, confession and repentance. Yep. And I think that that's sometimes overlooked. It's sometimes under uh, – we underestimate the power in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we think things. You touched on it earlier. We think things like, well, I want to handle – this is a sin problem. I want to handle it internally. I don't want to do this. I want to do this. And it, you, you need to take those measures. When it's criminal, it needs to be handled like a criminal act. All of those things need to happen. And still, the acts of confession and repentance can bring about healing. Yeah. Yep. In the long term. Absolutely. So there's people, I think, that you say these things and they think, boy, I did things 10 years ago that I really am ashamed of, or I I did this or I did that. And uh, and again, we're getting back to that issue of covering things up and not wanting to bring them out. But I'm telling you, there's so much power in yep. the process of confession and repentance. And it's one of, a- Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, I, and one of the things I think maybe we're missing in our tradition is, is that. Um, you know, we, we love sometimes as pro- in a Protestant Reformed right, tradition, right. we take shots at what we see in, in the Roman Catholic. Sure. And one of those is confession. Go to the priest and confess. Mm-hmm. It seems kind of rote. It seems kind of like, okay, why do you have to do that? And we, you know, we all have heard preaching about, I don't need a person to confess to. Jesus is my priest. And that's all true. Mm-hmm. It's all true. We need to confess to God. And uh, a priest doesn't stand between me and God. That's right. Jesus. So I, I, you know, we can have a Reformation podcast if we want to. But I also look at the tradition of a a process of 
allowing people to sit down with a spiritual person and confess sins. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think it has to be the priest or the pastor necessarily, but I think, you know, there's there's some wisdom in that, and I wish sometimes we had a better process. And ideally, I think this would take place in, like, discipleship groups right. with, with where, where men are with men, women are with women, and you have these strong f- relationships. If you're in a uh, Bible study connection group, there are mm-hmm. people in those groups that maybe you have real strong relationships with. So it doesn't have to be a formal kind of thing. It's somebody you know and trust, and, and you've built a relationship where you can share some of your baggage with them. Mm-hmm. And But there is a power in confession. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, a lot of the people who are, are sick or addicted or wounded and, and, and emotionally not well, a lot of that is because their stuff has never been confessed. Right. They've never told their stuff to a human being. Right. And I think there's just real power in 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 dragging our sin out of the darkness mm-hmm. and naming it, owning it, right, and then getting forgiveness. And, uh, you know, I don't know who that's speaking to today, but it may be that, that, that that's what God is saying to you, that, hey, it's time to drag that monster out of the closet. Right. Name it, own it, and can, and then get forgiveness. Yeah. And know that God does forgive you and that he loves you and that Christ died for you on the cross and by his grace we're made right with God. But yes, there is a powerful right. tradition of confession and repentance. And we've been in this Gospel Vision uh, series, and you've got this this frame we've been working on, if you've been following along, and it's God and man at the top. But the sides are so important because it's the man is is it's brokenness. It's that this is going to happen. Yep. Yep. And you just marked me earlier when we were in this podcast when we were talking, and you shared, okay, someone comes in and says, I'm dealing with lust, and here's what this looks like. And if, if you could, if you confess at that point, there's so much that there's so much damage that isn't done. Yeah, yeah. But too many times that story plays out. You don't confess at that point. You don't share with anyone at that point. You think you can bury. You think you can cover. And whether that's again institutional or personal, the earlier we bring this stuff out into the light, the better it is for everybody. Yep. yep. And so if you if you're doing it like you said, I don't know. Maybe this is for someone in particular. If if it's if it you're like ah, no, I think I can get a handle on it. I think I got. Just yeah. bring it out. Just bring it on out right yeah. now yeah. while while it's – and I don't know where anybody is, yeah. but yeah. maybe it's not the the monster it needs to be right now. Right. It's, it's, it, it's bigger in the darkness than it is in the light. I'll right, tell you that. right, right. And one of the power of 12-step groups – and I know there's some, you know, mm-hmm. weird things that can go on, you know, depending on the group right. and, and, and whether or not they're approaching it with a gospel vision. But a lot of 12-step groups really are – approaching things from a gospel vision, Mm -hmm. even if it's not explicit. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I've seen it in like Celebrate Recovery groups, and we used to have some of those groups here Mm -hmm. um, and others. One of the things I loved about it is is, is when you walked in the room, people own their sin. Yeah. And they, they, that was just part of it. That's like the entry level into the room that you, you know, it's not the entry level room. You're not going to go very far if you, but you're in a room with other people saying, this was my problem. That's this right. was my problem. This was my sin. You start looking around the room and go, you know, I think everybody in here deals with a sin problem. Yeah. And you go, you know, you're right. Everybody in here does deal with a sin problem, yeah. including me. And then you you find a safe space. That, you know, there's power. Okay, here's a safe space for me to say, okay, I'm battling this. I'm battling this addiction. I'm battling this behavior or something like that. We need those healthy spaces. And too many times in churches, we don't have those spaces. Mm -hmm. And and sadly, too many times in church, it's about coming and pretending we got everything together rather than a space where I can come and confess Mm -hmm. and and, and admit and and receive forgiveness and restoration. Mm. Well, again, Pastor, thank you so much for sharing everything you shared today. That was that was a, a great discussion. We we seemed well rested. That's what I feel like. We had a couple <laughs> weeks to rejuvenate. We're there back. We came out swinging on the podcast today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. And you know, we teased in the beginning. Sincerely, every time I see somebody at church or at Publix, and you stop me and tell me you listen to the Rice Cast, it fills my heart up. I, I'm like, oh, good. Because you may not see this right now, but me and Pastor are just in a room all by ourselves. This happens at Publix to you? People uh, stop at me at Publix, yeah. Publix. And they'll say, they'll say, hey, you're the guy that does the podcast, right? <laughs> It's perfect. So, all right. There are some out there that think that's my whole role at Calvary. I just wait until the <laughs> appropriate time when I walk. That's all he does. I'm here with the microphones, and that's my, <laughs> my gig. And it's not a bad one, I got to tell you. 
Uh, so appreciate you, everybody that listens. Uh, one thing that's so helpful, one way that you can really help if you uh, rate the podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, it's usually a star system. Uh, if you rate it or leave a review, that's very helpful. It helps us get the word out about the podcast. Uh, so thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for following along. And we'll be back with another episode very soon.